Hello, everybody, and welcome to the first session of the U.S. Fasteners Guild Virtual Symposium. My name is Justin K. Prim, and I'm going to be the presenter for this first, uh, this first conversation that we're going to have, which is going to be the future of gem cutting. So um, if you don't know me, my name is Justin K. Prim, and I'm coming to you guys live from Bangkok. Uh, we're going to have a really fun time tonight. We have some really... Uh, some really cool young cutters that we're going to talk to from all over the world. So tonight we're going to be speaking to Nadine Marshall from Washington, USA. We're going to be speaking to Imogen Redvers Jones from Whitby, England. And we're going to be talking to Bjorn Marischeki from Arusha, Tanzania. So I hope you guys are ready. I hope you're awake. I know in America, it's, and especially on the West Coast, it's early right now. Um, so I want to thank you guys for, for joining us. And I'm definitely looking forward to the, the whole weekend's worth of, uh, of, uh, of conversations and, and webinars and everything. I wanted to thank uh, Dan Lynch and the whole US Fasteners Guild team for, for setting this up and, and for, for inviting me to be a part of it. And uh, definitely want to thank all of uh, my uh, my interviewees that we're going to speak to tonight, because because yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to seeing um, where we go with this and what we get into. So, I guess uh, if if you guys are ready, Nadine, Imogen, and Bjorn, come on in and we can get uh, we can get going here. See how you guys are doing. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. Hi. Hi. How's it going? Good. Morning. Hello, Bjorn. So everybody. Bjorn, you're sideways. Hello. I think. Can you see me? Yeah, but you're sideways. This way. Oh, we lost him. Oh, you got me. Cool. There we oh. go. Hi. Hi. So we are currently in four different countries right now, in in four different time zones. Um, I haven't done a, I haven't done a group conversation like this, so I think this is going to be exciting. I'm really looking forward to seeing what you guys have to say and getting to know you guys a little bit better. So, um, to all of the guests here, we have, uh, some things that we want to talk about, but of course, if you guys have some questions that you want to, uh, ask our guests, feel free to put them into the Q and A, and I'm going to be keeping track of those questions as we go and, and throwing them out to our young cutters here. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, I guess before we get into any deep conversation, let's just get an idea about who you guys are. So I guess we'll start with Nadine, since I know you are the youngest of our trio tonight, or sorry, here it's tonight. I know for you it's early morning. But um, Nadine, can you please tell us a bit about who you are, where, where you are, and, and what you are, or, or whatever? <laughs> Sure. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Nadine. I am 14 years old and from Washington State in the United States. Um, I have been precision fasting since I was 12 years old, and I'm just super grateful to be here. Cool. And um, I guess I have some photos as well that I'll show as we go. So just uh, just to show a few of Nadine's stones just so we can get an idea about what kind of stuff she's been doing. Um, maybe Nadine, you want to just give us a couple of ideas about what we're looking at with these two? Uh, sure. Um, the finished gem on the right is a tanzanite and I believe that's a heliodor on the left that I was working on. Okay. So we've got photos from everybody, so I'll just kind of pop them in as we go. Um, but let's go over to uh, let's go to Bjorn. We'll do we'll do uh, girl guy girl just to keep it even. Bjorn, how are you doing this morning? I'm good. My name is Bjorn Marischeki, and I'm from Arusha, Tanzania, in East Africa. Um, famous to uh, a couple of national parks that most people might know: Serengeti, Ngorongoro, um, famous Kilimanjaro. Um, I am also a Maasai, uh, the tribe Maasai for all those who've been in the East Africa region. Um, I've been cutting for four years. I started at the Arusha Gemological Training Center and I started with the Imahashi 
and I moved on to the Facetron, and I'm now working on a Facet. Um, I'm also, I own a Tanzanite mine with my father in Marani, and that's what I do for for the time being, and I also teach at the Arusha Gemological School. Awesome, and so you're coming to us right now from Arusha? Yes, Arusha, Tanzania. Cool, and I've got a few of your stones as well, so let me show, I'll just show off a few and then I'll, I'll share some more later, but uh, so I, yeah. so maybe give us an idea about what we're looking at with these two. Um, the, the one on the left is a green tourmaline princess cut, and the one on the le on the right is a pink tourmaline I did while I was here in Tanzania. Okay, and so are you mostly, are you only cutting in Tanzania, or are you going to other countries as well to do different stuff? No, no. No, I'm only cutting in Tanzania. Okay, cool. Yeah. Well, thanks for being here. It's, it's good to have you. And Thank uh, you. what about you, Imogen? What, what's, your, what's your story? Oh, hi, I'm Imogen. I am from Whitby, which is on the northeast coast of England. Um, I specialize in cutting Whitby Jack, which is a local gemstone to where I am. I've been doing it about um, coming up to six years. I started when I was 18 and I'm just about to turn 24 next month. Um, and it's a family business, so I'm a third generation jet carver. It's something that's been passed down from my granddad to my dad and now me. Cool, very cool. And uh, I got a few photos of yours as well. So if you guys haven't seen jet carving before, then, then you're about to, because this is some of Imogen's work. And uh, Imogen, give us a little bit of an idea about what we're looking at with these two pieces. So on the left hand side we have a bat which is quite a popular symbol in Whitby because of the story of Dracula and it has um, a Victorian style greenberry pattern carving on it and then on the right hand side we have a pair of drops that have a forget-me-not um, and a leaf carving again this is very traditional Victorian style carving um, and it's quite a unique style not very many people still carve like this Cool. pretty much yeah. um, me my dad and a handful of other people, but apart from that, it's fairly unique. Very cool. So yeah, again, thanks for being here. Um, I know uh, Imogen and I met, I think, uh, what, a year or two ago in Whitby, um, yeah. whenever I was there doing some some research about gem cutting. And then, uh, and, and as we're gonna see in a little bit, Imogen has inherited a very, very cool uh, historical museum that's all, about cutting Whitby jet. So we're gonna see some photos from that later. And uh, Nadine and I met just this past Tucson, just for an evening. We were, we were like kicking it at a party together uh, for like a half an hour. And then, uh, Bjorn and I have not met in person. So, so really just the prep for this talk has been uh, our first introductions, but hopefully soon I'm gonna make my way out to Arusha. So we all get to say hi in person so yeah uh, definitely you're most welcome yeah I, I want to so let's hear a little bit about how you guys got into cutting um because i know you know the the whole idea with tonight's talk is you know the future of gem cutting and, and one of the things that i wanted to explore through this talk is how do we get young people into cutting so maybe it's good to understand each of your guys's individual stories because i think they're probably quite different considering that you're all living in different countries. So um, maybe this time we'll start with Imogen just to go the other way around. And uh, tell, us, tell us how you got started and, and yeah, how, how did you get to this point? Um, so I have grown up with my dad and my granddad cutting jet um, since I was tiny. In fact, before I was born, they've been doing it. So I grew up watching my granddad and my dad. Um, and it was something that I was always really interested in, but I never thought I would ever become a jet carver until I turned 18 and I decided to have a go. And my dad likes to tell me that it's genetic. So that's why I'm good at cutting jet is it's genetics, it's not me. Um, and I don't know whether he's right or not, but it definitely seems to be through the family line. Um, we have in our shop, we have the last remaining Victorian jet workshop. So. I don't know if everybody knows what jet is, but it's a biogenic gemstone. It's black. Um, it's found along a seven and a half mile stretch of coastline. Um, and Whitby's in the middle of that. Um, and it's quite unique because it's found through coastal erosion. So it's not actually mined anymore. 
Um, it was really popular in the Victorian era, mainly because of Queen Victoria. When her husband died, she wore um, Whitby Jetta's mourning and she declared that it was the mourning gem of the British Empire. So most people have this association with Jet being a mourning stone, but it's been used since the Bronze Age um, all throughout history. Um, so there's a lot of history to Whitby Jet, but it's quite a unique thing. Um, and with having that particular specialism I've learned a lot about cutting jet but I wouldn't say that I was a faceter um, I specialized more in sort of lapidary art um, and it was really the skills that I have have been passed down from my granddad to my dad and now to me um, but it's one of these jobs where you start learning you start carving and the more you do the better you get which is like most things but you learn your own sort of technique and the way you like to carve it's a bit like a style like an artist you get a style that you like doing um so i have um more of a modern style than my dad or granddad but i still like to keep the traditional patterns which is what you saw in the first slide of pictures and so for me it's about finding a balancing out between the traditional and keeping the traditional carving alive but also adding in a more modern element which maybe makes it more appealing for the younger generation yeah and so just out of curiosity, how many other, in Whitby at least, how many other jet carvers are there in the whole city? Um, well, Whitby is quite a small place. There's one big company that own maybe six shops, but none of their jet is actually cut in Whitby. And apart from that, there's, um, so there's less than 10 jet cutters. Um, there's some other really brilliant, talented people in Whitby, and it's, very interesting to talk to them um, because you can always pick up bits of information from other people but not many um, and there aren't really any jet cutters anywhere else in, in the UK apart from in Whitby there's some jet cutters in Spain in Asturias I was very lucky two years ago uh, more than two years ago three years ago oh, maybe four <laughs> a few years ago um, I got to fly out with another lady who is a jet cutter, Sarah Steele, we went out to see them and to see the way that they cut their jet. So that was really interesting. I borrowed a lot of their techniques. Um, so there's not very many of us left. Yeah, um, it's a, it seemed like a rare breed. of. Uh, I mean, I guess that was one of the things that I was so impressed with when I met you in your shop. Like, besides the fact that you were, uh, you know, obviously the youngest jet, jet cutter that I, that I met there, but I was just like, wow, this girl... She's already got a, sh I mean, I know it's through your family, but like you already have a shop. You were in there like, you know, actually carving behind the counter and just people can watch you work. And I, I was just so impressed and the historical connection to me was just so cool. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm psyched that we get to understand a little bit more about that story tonight. Bjorn, what about you? How did you get into this? And, um, and you know, what, what brought you into the world of gem cutting? So I grew up in a family with uh, gemstones. My father has been working on the mine for 20 years now. So mm -hmm. I kind of grew up around uh, gemstones and coming home and hearing stories about the mine, and seeing rough pictures. And I just grew up in that kind of atmosphere. And when I got to around uh, finishing my high school, I uh, was in town and through the business, my dad met Roger Derry and uh, when I got to talking to him and seeing his pictures, he um, advised me into entering the cutting school. So I started there and I did five months of training there. And after that, I uh, seeked more. I wanted to know more because my work was still not there. So I wanted to, to, to get to where I was going. So I um, went up to Nairobi to meet uh, Marvin Wambua, who... Uh, gave me like a week or two training there and so I got more um, training there and then ever since Roger Roger comes here a couple of times a year and every time he's here we spend a lot of time he, training me just to get to that great cutting yeah so that's how I got into cutting and so this is in this is this is inside the school where you are doing the training Yes, this is a picture that was taken uh, last year. I was training a couple of uh, students there to switch from uh, 
the normal training into like precision cutting with the new uh, machines that Gem Legacy has uh, donated into the school. So I go there and I train them to be professional with the cutting. Okay. And uh, so... Um, so it's like a little concert. Okay. And you sent me a couple of cool photos that were kind of unusual from everybody else. So I'll, I'll share them just to give people an idea about the world that you're living mm -hmm. in, because I think it's a bit different than, you know, for all of our American viewers or even our British viewers right now, we don't really get to see wildlife like this in our, in our day-to-day -day experience. So, um, yeah, I just, I was, I was, yeah. I was really impressed with these because I was expecting to see stone photos and suddenly I'm like, wow, okay, we're looking at, uh, you know, just a totally different kind of environment. So is this, is this part of your like sort of daily experience? Do you often see animals like this or this is a special, um, moment? So, so um, the town I live in is kind of like the middle of the, it's, it's where everybody gets to first before they go to the national park. So we have uh, the Arusha National Park, which is really close to us. And then we have the Serengeti, that's a couple of kilometers away. And we have the Ngorongoro. So everybody enters Arusha first in order to get to these national parks. So it's, I sometimes take some time to go see the national parks to myself. I just got back from Manyara as we speak. So um, I go back to um, seeing that cool uh, and sometimes when I'm going around you might even see these animals while you're heading to the mine okay so, yeah so that's definitely like a it's like a safari mining trip all together in one and and, yeah. and, and what about this what are we definitely. looking at here this is one of the ones that you sent me uh, so this is a it's a tribe and this is like a tradition uh, the men would uh, stand in like a circle a semicircle and this is just a tradition of, uh, it's a traditional dance. Okay. Uh, Maasai, and uh, Maasai is a tribe, M-A-A-S-I, S-A-I, is a tribe, a very well-known tribe here in um, Tanzania. And they're located close to these uh, national parks. Okay. Very cool. So we're, yeah. we're definitely getting a glimpse into a different side of, of life right now so I'm I'm, I'm so pleased yep. that we have such a diverse um, kind of conversation that's unfolding here yeah um, okay so Nadine let's let's come back to you and see how did you how did you get into gym cutting how did you how did you start so young because you're you're obviously uh, even even younger than Bjorn um well I mean I've been into rocks and gems or rock hunting with my grandma and my dad since I was like three. Um, and we have joined rock clubs and I had seen fasted gems, but I, and I was interested on in how they do it, but nobody was willing to teach me because I was a kid. <laughs> and then we moved up here to Washington um, when I was 12. And we joined a rock club and a gentleman was like, anybody that wants to learn how to facet, I'll teach them. I don't care your age. And I was like, did I try this? Like, I like rocks and gems, but I really don't know how to use that or what I'm supposed to do with that. Like, is it okay if I learn? He was like, yeah, sure. Um, and then I found out later, he was like, I was actually meeting older people, but I mean, you can learn too. Um, so a few months after I first started learning, we went to this actually gem show and I demonstrated in, at our local rock show. And that's really where I was like, my parents and I were like, we, I think it's time we should try saving up for my own machine. And I think it was only two months after the show, we had finally saved up enough to get my own machine, my own machine and start working from home. Um, and once I started working from home, I was able to learn new techniques and, um, and make, and like have, um, I started using more social media to connect with mentors and figure things out like that. So I kind of like Mike taught me the basics and then I learned a lot from the U.S. Fasters Guild's newsletters and things like that to mm -hmm. help 
piece together the newer techniques. Okay, so once you kind of got the basics, then you're sort of somewhat self-taught then, I'm guessing, like after you had yeah. that initial lesson. Yeah. Yeah, we spent about six months with him learning like how the machine works, the basics of like dopping and transferring and neat points. But then after that, because he was self, my mentor was self-taught too. So um, after that, I started like, you know, learning new tricks and things like that, newer habits and doing research. And so at this point in the picture, this is before you had your own machine. So you're, you're demoing on somebody else's machine. Yeah. I'm working on Mike's machine. Uh, my mentor, he, okay. <laughs> we, we used to joke around that he, he has a junkyard full of fasting machines. He has about every single type of fasting machine I could think of. Oh man, that's cool. And so, okay, that, well, that kind of brings me into my next question that I wanted to ask is what kind of machine are you guys using? So Nadine, since you're already telling us the story, keep on going. So what did you end up buying? Um, well, I started on a Ultratech V2 and then I, I used his newer upgraded Ultratech, which I really liked. So we ended up buying an Ultratech V2 with a digital mast. So like the degree, um, the ink, the degree thing is digital instead of manual. Okay. You got like so the, the super high tech top of the line one. So you're, you're starting off good. Like you don't have to upgrade. It's one of the older um, ish ultra tech. So we want to get a V5, which is oh, one okay. of like the new ones soon. Okay. So it's like an because upgrade. My, too, I see. Yeah, mine's a little run down because we didn't buy a brand brand new. We bought it from an estate sale. Oh, that's cool. But the guy took really good care of it. And yeah, it was pretty awesome. Okay. They're really nice. And so every, so now you, you did your training and, and you're doing your main work uh, always on Ultratech. You haven't tried any other ones before? Yeah. Yeah. I've always done ultra text. I mean, I had a, the option to learn how to use, uh, I forget the name of the machine. No. Um, but it was like a hand. Okay. One. Yeah. Like, a hand but hand. I, I really liked the dig the mast and was cool with what I was learning on. Cool. Um, and Bjorn, what about you? I know you already kind of mentioned a little bit that you'd gone from a few different machines. So tell us, tell us what you were working on first and then how did you segue into what you're doing now? So I started at the school with uh, Facetron, I mean, uh, Imahashi, and then I moved on to Facetron and actually I'm in, the, in my office right now and I have a facet behind me. Okay. Um, okay. And also, um, just so I don't forget how to use one, I have a fast facetron also, right here. Oh, okay. So, so I'm working. I'm working both machines. Yeah. And I forgot to ask you this before. Somebody had put it into the questions, but Bjorn, how old are you? We didn't get your age at the beginning. Oh, I'm 22. Okay. So we got. Nadine, 14, Bjorn, 22, Imogen, 20, 20 what? 23. 23, okay, so a nice, um, a nice spread here. Um, okay, so, and then, uh, so, so Bjorn, you've, you've gone from handpiece, well, I know before the, the school that you were learning and everything was handpiece in the beginning, right? Before, before the Gem Legacy yes. thing started. So everyone there, as far as I've seen from the photos, everybody yes. there was using um, Imahashi style. So then what's it been yes. like? So um, at the school. Sorry, go, go ahead. Uh, so at the school, uh, the Imahashi, start cutting on the Imahashi. You would learn the designs on the Imahashi. You would learn how to polish on the Imahashi. And then you would move on to the Facetron as a, like to touch up your knowledge. So you would do a couple of stones, maybe three or four stones on the Facetron as a completion of your training. So, yeah. 
Okay, so that was kind of like, once you've learned everything on the handpiece, your final icing on the yeah. cake is going to be more precision. Yeah. Style. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And so yeah. now that you've used, you know, several different machines, what do you, what do you prefer? I prefer the facet. The facet is my favorite machine. Okay. Uh, I enjoy it a lot. It's a very precise machine. I got to see a demo of one of those uh, this past Tucson. It was um, Boyd Fox. I don't know if you know him, but he he did a demo, a recutting demo on a facet, and I was like, so shocked. I mean, it was just he was so fast. I couldn't believe how fast it was. And the, he cut a stone in like 30 minutes. And it was, you know, the, the considering how quick he did it and that everyone was watching him and asking questions, it was, it was good, you know, and I was, I was really impressed. I was like, wow, this is the kind of thing that will make me possibly switch back. Cause I went from a, I went from an ultra tech to a handpiece. I went the other way from you. So, but when I saw the fast side, I was like, this is the only mask machine I've seen that will, kind of give me a urge to go back to a mast because of the, just because of the speed I was really wow. impressed so I don't uh, mm -hmm. I don't yeah. doubt that you're having a good time with yeah. that it's, it's good to have like a knowledge of all three machines it's, it's easier to help out and teach other people that are started probably on the Imahashi or started on the Fasatron and moving on to the Imahashi or both ways yeah it's very good but the facet is it's a really great machine. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay. So, and Imogen, what about you? Um, I know you're not faceting, so your gear is going to be totally different than than what everyone else has been using. Um, tell us a little bit about how do you do? What kind of gear do you need to have to do the kind of carving that you do on the jet? Um. Well. I do most of my cutting with a diamond saw um, from the raw material and then my basic shaping I use an America tool flat lap. Um, I find that's really good with a diamond disc and then all my carving work um, I use a Ford and micro motor with a range of diamond discs and diamond burrs. I sometimes use tungsten carbide burrs. I prefer um, the tungsten carbide sometimes because it doesn't scratch the jet as much which means when it comes to polishing um, I don't have to use such an aggressive polish which is great because you don't want to lose the detail that you carve into a design and then most of the polishing I do um, by hand so I use different kinds of wet and dry um, which is like a sandpaper and then a range of sort of normal polishes, um, Tripoli, aluminium oxide, that sort of thing. That's all on small calico mops. But most of the methods that I use are directly taken from the Victorian method, so just modernised and miniaturised. <laughs> so a workshop in the Victorian era that would have had six people working in it, um, I have down, squished into my jewellery bench and I've got everything I need there. Um, but yeah, certainly different from faceting, different different ball game all together really yeah and so i know for jet it's it's a super soft stone right it's much softer than any of the hard stones that the other two Definitely. cutters so is polishing is that end up being like a really tricky thing so that you don't end up like er erasing everything that you've done and, and even like sort of melting the stone away Yes, um, so Whitby Jet is only about three and a half to four on the Mo hardness scale and it's not a crystalline sub substance, it's a fossil. So when you're polishing you have to be really careful. I remember when I first started out I'd carved this really beautiful design with roses and leaves and then I stuck it straight against my polisher and pulled it back and half my work had gone because I'd pushed it too hard and I hadn't cut my design in deep enough and I'd polished it all the way because the jets are oh. soft. So it's definitely a learning curve um yeah. I'll, just show, thing, I'll just show a few because i know this um yeah. th this seahorse is pretty pretty ornate just so people can kind of have a visualization about how yeah. intricate how big is I that piece on the right um i would say it's probably about 45 mil um okay, so not so yeah not it's quite big um for me <laughs> but 
I loved making that piece. Um, it was actually one of the first three-dimensional carvings I ever did. Um, and I've made that design again, but mostly with designs, I sort of do one-off pieces um, that I do quite a lot of animals and things, um, which my dad doesn't do, so it's sort of unique to me. But with that kind of work, there's a lot of processes that go into polishing it without actually wrecking your design. Um, mm. Like on the fin, there's very fine cuts. And so when you go to polish them, you have to be careful because you can just straight up polish them out. Yeah. Um, and so I, it, I, I know uh, also in the, the Victorian days, they were doing everything or they were doing a lot of stuff with hand tools. I mean, like little saws right. and little files and stuff. Are you still using some of those processes or is everything now like, you, you know, with a micro motor and stuff like you were saying, electric? electric? Um, to be honest, I tend to use a micro motor. Um, but you have a whole other problem with friction then because if you get your jet too hot, it tends to crack. So that again is a learning curve. Um, but I have used the hand tools before. Um, it's quite satisfying. Um, I used some when I went to Spain. Um, so you can see on the pictures you've just put up, um, on the right hand side is a piece that I carved when I was in Spain. That's a traditional Asturian symbol. And then on the left hand side, that is a pair of um, drops that are very traditionally Victorian, so they've got a shackle, um, which means they're all articulated, um, and that kind of twisted edge as well is a very traditional Victorian thing to carve. Um, but those are quite big. I don't, they're sort of like showy off earrings. Not very many people want such big earrings, but I love them. Um, they're very traditional. Okay, cool. And so uh, somebody just popped up a question, so I'll just put it out to everybody before we move on. Um, have you guys, and I guess this is more focused towards the faceters, but have you guys um, used any software in your designing so far, or, or have you only used like pre-made um, designs? Go for it. I have, I've actually been learning how to use GemCut Studio more recently. So I guess, yeah, I do use um, some soft computer software. Okay. And, and how's, it, how's it going? Is it is it coming easy or is there a lot of things? I mean, at first, at first it was kind of tricky to figure out, but once I figured out some of the quartz, I was like, or quarks, then I was like, wow, this is way easy. Like, this is so helpful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think so too. Bjorn, what about you? Have you played around with any of this stuff? Yeah, I've used CAD, GemCAD, uh, but I only use it to modify the designs that are given to me so I could uh, have a better uh, light return. So, um, yeah, okay. but I normally have designs out printed out ready for myself. Okay. And yeah. I, I guess for you, I'm curious for, for some of the other cutters that you interact with in Arusha, is, is you know, using the software and modifying designs to optimize light return. Is this something that a lot of people know about where you're at or are you um, unique in, in using that stuff? Uh, I'm unique in using that stuff. I'm unique in even the way I cut. It's completely different from everything you see in town. Uh, I, I'm precision cutting. So every time I go visit a shop of someone cutting, they're always doing commercial cutting and they're always basing on oh, you can't cut this way because it reduces the weight, or you can't cut this way because the person's going to complain about the weight. Um, so there's a really big difference between talking to other cutters here in Arusha and meeting with them. Uh, actually, the only person I actually met and I could talk to them and they would understand was um, Marvin Wambua in Nairobi. He also precision cuts, so it's good to finally meet someone and talk to them about how... Uh, uh, weight doesn't really like you, you shouldn't be concerned on the weight you should be concerned on like how um the, like, the how beautiful the stone is when you finish regardless of the weight that's lost so yeah. it's actually pretty interesting to talk to people here about that yeah yeah i know here in bangkok i've had that conversation several times with people you know because i think probably bangkok is 
you know, pretty old school, kind of exactly what you're saying, very focused on weight, not really focused on yep. brilliance, not always focused on beauty, just preserving the stone and getting the color out of it. And so, you know, some of the factories yep. that we work with here, they're, they're kind of in our mentality of like, okay, it's okay to sacrifice some weight if you get a better stone out of it. But even they tell me when they yep. speak to other cutting factories and try to push this idea to other tie cutters, the other tie cutters are just like, no, yep. you know, like they, they're, they're not adopting this idea. They still believe that it's all about, you know, cause they're getting more money for the weight cause they're just charging for carrot. But yeah. They're not really thinking about the final sale of the stone or whatever. So it's, it's a, it's yeah. interesting to see that that's conversations happening really every place that people, you know, where there's an old tradition and a new tradition that's kind of butting heads. Um, yeah. Well, let's talk a little Definitely. bit about, specialties and specializations and Bjorn since I'm already talking to you let's just keep on rolling so I know you said already yeah. you're 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 kind of unique in your area because of the precision cutting are are you only yeah. doing precision cutting now or, or you know do you uh, work in competitions do you do production work or is it just one kind of thing I'm 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 focused on precision cutting. I, when I get a piece of rough, I just make sure that it's precision. Like the beauty comes out. None. I, I really uh, I don't really try to save the weight, but I um, sometimes I have that question in my mind: How do I how do I try and save the weight without not destroying the design or without destroying the beauty that will come out if I continued with the same stone? So, but I'm more focused on the precision cutting yeah okay and and i'm guessing just from what you're saying yeah. that most other people that are cutting in arusha are kind of more just commercial cutting like just just trying to get the stones done yeah. without necessarily yeah. considering optics and stuff like that yeah so actually a few uh, months ago i've been going around and looking at what people are producing and having conversations with people who buy rough and then go get it cut and the uh, biggest uh, topic is oh well this stone um, it's not good for cutting because it will lose a lot of weight and you don't want to lose a lot of weight because you won't get paid enough for the, the rough the amount of rough that you bought uh, a lot of people here are focused on um, on weight so okay. it's just like let's see how much weight gets returned so okay okay good insight and, and so it's, it's it's more of a market of like it's more of a market of being sold inside and to like cutters from india and it's not international cutters it's like people are are cutting or taking stones to get cut so they could be sold within and to to some dealers here in arusha who look for commercial cutting so no one i don't think they have the exposure for um international cutting here but it's more of commercial cut it's the quickest to sell so actually i got my i cut my fiance the tanzanite on a ring and it was a 6.23 carat stone and when i got to take it to get heated they the people there were looking at it and were like wow this is beautiful but where are you gonna sell it this such a high crown or uh where where did you get this design it's not a commercial design where are you gonna sell it it's gonna take time to get sold so i find that pretty interesting i was like yeah so there's like a whole market that you're tapped into that they're not even aware of basically yeah yeah okay and uh, somebody from the audience eric peterson had asked are you doing mostly from rough or do you're doing recuts as well no i'm focused on more on rough okay cool and i'm still uh, training uh, and yeah no it's good that's good yeah. nadine what about you what's your fo what's your focus right now are you are you i know i've seen you selling stones on facebook so obviously you're you are doing business but are you focused mostly on like cutting to sell for and doing precision or commercial or are you also focused on like competition and competition style cutting as well um yeah i I do focus on precision faceting and I would like to uh, learn how to do competition faceting because um, I do, I am very competitive and enjoy doing 
that type of stuff. Um, yeah. Okay. And so, um, are you, are you selling everything that you're cutting now or is some stuff still like, are you still practicing? Not everything. I don't, I mean, I sell some of my gems, um, so that I can, you know, in, invest in, in my business and like right now I'm doing the fundraiser for my friend and um, to help buy different types necessarily of gems so that I can learn on material, different materials and get more experience in, I guess. Okay, cool. No, that's good. <laughs> and Imogen, what about you? I know you, you sort of have, uh, have told us this already, but tell us a little bit more about how you specialize stylistically when you're doing the jet. Cause I know you were comparing between what your father was doing and maybe even what your grandfather was doing. So yeah. what do you, so what do you when my, when my granddad started off, he had very, very basic tools. So um, a bit more like Victorian style tools, actually, sort of a lot more hand tools. Um, and he did a lot more traditional work. Um, and my dad specializes in Victorian carving. And whilst I love doing the Victorian carving, um, especially, you know, the earrings and things, um, I really like doing modern things. But it's a little bit different because I have a shop um, and my livelihood comes from making sales on a day to day basis. I also have to take into consideration what people want to buy um, in terms of jewellery. So I do things I think people will like as well as things that I really am passionate about. Um, but I've started sort of doing a lot more of my own style um, because really I think that's what people are looking for. They're looking for something different. Mm -hmm. um, and whether that's something that's a bit modern or whether that's a traditional piece that no one else can do um, so I sort of have two avenues uh, okay. I wouldn't really put myself in the one box um, but the specific thing is jet itself I do use other stones but they tend to be like amber or turquoise um, I work with coral sometimes um, or you can see there's pearls on these ones and then there's um mm -hmm. there's an opal on the other one although you can't really see the color in it because of the photograph but it, um i think the jet is a good background for these other stones yeah uh, and so since uh, since you're saying you're you're kind of responding to customer demands do you do you kind of experiment and try different things to see how customers will react or are are they literally telling you like oh i w i really wish that you know, there was a piece with a couple of opals that looked weird and funky or, or how specific um, is it? Well, because we deal with the general public, we get weird and wonderful requests. Um, and sometimes I think, oh yeah, that's a really good idea and I will, I will listen to what they say. Um, but sometimes their requests are so wacky that I just go, hmm, <laughs> and I go with um, what I want to do. But really, I'm always thinking about jewelry. I'm always thinking about jet. Um, so that's where a lot of my ideas come from. The ones on these slides, um, those have both been commission pieces. So someone has come to me and said, can you carve me the black rabbit of death from Watership down? I'd like it this size for the red eye. Um, wow. Or I'd like a dragon that's very stylized based off the Game of Thrones dragon. Um, okay. But I want a tiger. <laughs> I in it so that they're both commission pieces so really the design of that is driven by what the customer was looking for um okay and uh tony collins in the audience just asked who does the the metal work for you are you doing that too or do you work with a a jeweler no no i do that i do all of that um all of the metal work you can i do pan cut and then myself okay um, and have you i wouldn't uh, ask myself I wouldn't class myself as a silversmith, but um, I do have those skills. <laughs> yeah. And I, I guess getting the jet to work with the metal is probably part of the art as well, right? You have to kind of do some problem solving to figure out how you're going to set it safely. Um, you can't close that jet. It's too soft. So 
the pressure between the stone and the claws, which is what you want. Usually it, it chips the jet and the jet will fall out. So you have to be a bit creative. Um, I always say you have to treat jet like you treat a pearl. So quite often there's um, adhesive involved just because it's so soft. That's the only thing you can do really. Um, but it's you certainly have to put the jet before the metal when you're thinking about designs. Okay. And uh, Tony Collins in the audience asks, have you ventured into carving other types of materials since obviously you've gotten really good at doing jet? <laughs> um, I like amber. I like um, turquoise. Um, I'd like to start with other things, um, but it's just getting my hands on them and figuring out yeah. a different method because I'm not, I mean, I haven't been to school for this or anything like that. It's just um, knowledge that's been passed down through the generations. So. Yeah. It's all so soft talk. I, I guess if we, if, we gen, if we generalize, I guess we can say your specialty is soft stones because it seems like you're doing a lot of stuff with soft stones, which probably a lot of people yeah. have, would have a hard time with if they don't have the training to do that. To me, soft stones seem like the easiest option. I mean, maybe that's just because what I'm used to and the idea of working with hard stones sort of scares me a bit, but um, I guess I could learn to do that. But I just, I really like being able to, to work with, the carving aspect and I think that blends itself better to a soft stone than it does to a hard stone. Yeah, interesting. Okay, let me let me throw it back over to Bjorn. I got another idea, uh, another topic I want to go into. So we kind of have an idea now with all three of you, who you are, where you come from, what are you doing as far as your work goes. But let's talk a little bit about, you know, get into our topic tonight, which is the future. So I, I, first I want to speak specifically about you guys and where do you want to go from here you know the i mean i've i've kind of gotten all three of you together because you're some of the youngest gem cutters and carvers that i know and so i i want to see from your guys's point of view where where is it going to go from here you know like if you're uh, of course for nadine she's two years into it imogen six years into it um where is it going to go from here so bjorn let's start with you where do you see it going as far as art the art side of it or your creative side of it and also where do you see the business side for you going and, and how deep do you want to go with the cutting business? Um, yeah. So on both sides, I'd like to increase my education so I can teach other people, teach the youth in Tanzania to, to uh, get uh, jobs um, in this place, in this, in this career. I feel like this is a career that's not been tapped to, into here. It's like every shop you go into, there's just um, um, older gentlemen's, um, working on this uh, type of work but I'd like to get more training so I could help other people learn that it's something that the youth could do also and on the other side I'm looking more of um, producing uh, precision cut tanzanite from the source from the mine to uh, to a dealer who comes here but completely uh, faceted precision faceted tanzanite there Okay. And I just want to, 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 to have people learn about the beauty in cutting, precision cutting, and uh, not kind of change the mindset of, of the mass production into precision cutting. Okay. And so, yeah, as you, as you said earlier, most of your uh, peers and other cutters in your area are still kind of focused on uh, this traditional way of cutting, which is, you know, focused on weight. So are you seeing that other people, are other people seeing what you're doing and kind of changing their ideas a little bit? Or are you really like kind of an outlander in your, in your city? Uh, I'm, I'm slowly uh, getting my work out there to show people uh, the difference between mass production and precision cutting. Um, actually, uh, it was actually funny when I took the, uh, the my fiance's ring to get set. Uh, the owner looked at my work and was like, "Wow, did you cut this?" And I was like, "Yeah, I cut this." And I was like, "Wow, this is different from anyone I've seen here in in Arusha. This is this is great work. I'd like to do business with you." So it's uh, I think uh, if we got if I got the work out more to for people to see, maybe they would change their a perspective of mass cutting into precision cutting, I guess. Yeah. 
but right now I'm sort of like an outlander to anyone who sees my work. They're like, wow, uh, pretty different, but yeah. And and so I'm, I'm wondering <clears throat> for Arusha, is there much of a market for cut stones there or do you have to try and um, kind of push it onto the internet or, or into, into social media to be able to actually make sales? Uh, I could sell my stones here. I have a couple people who would actually buy iron stones. Um, but it would, uh, just like being different from, uh, the, the work here, it would take me a longer time to sell my stones as opposed to a commercial cut because, uh, most people are looking for things that they're used to. It's like I'm paving a way to, to a different set of, uh, cut yeah okay very cool so you're you're really kind of changing the game right now you're you're showing people something that they haven't really seen before and as you yeah. said teaching people so maybe in another five or ten years you got a whole new generation of cutters coming in who can benefit from your ideas and the way that you cut which is obviously not what they're going to get from somebody else in the, in the same area yeah so uh, I think it's very important for for me to continue teaching the youth and the people who are going through these schools because our government right now is changing the laws of the gemstone uh, business. They want they they want, they're looking to go into that direction of creating all cut stone all stones from Tanzania to be cut in the country. So I think it's a it's a good place to start in teaching the the youth here that. This is the way to cut because in the future, all cut, all stones are have going to be cut in Tanzania. So it's good to get a head start. Okay, and so you're going to be maybe yeah. one of the first ones, you know, because I guess that idea, what that idea ends up being, is it it builds a it builds a market for cut stones in Arusha that doesn't really exist right now, as far as I know. So if that happens, then you're going to be the the superstar of the, of that first wave whenever people start coming for cut stones and you have the best cut stones or or maybe your students also have the best cut stones you're going to sell before anybody else so this is really a this is a great idea actually especially considering your particular situation yeah. right now Very yeah cool. i think uh i i try to tell the students while they're there um to think about the type of cut they want to do like what are you producing who are you producing for uh are you cutting for the market here or are you cutting for an international dealer who's coming here to look for stones how do you want your work to be presented do you want it to be precision or do you want it to be commercial so i i always ask these things while i'm teaching them how to cut or helping them with a the design i just want them to have this thing that they're thinking in their mind is it precision or is it commercial what where am i going what's the future of this skill that i'm acquiring today so no, yeah that's great i mean as a gym cutting teacher you're speaking right to my heart right now because this is the exact kind of thing that we're doing here in bangkok as well so i think it's awesome that you're i didn't realize you were so involved in teaching i think it's i think it's great because this is you know this is really what i think is where where it has to go for it creating new generations and you know passing this down Nadine, what about you? Um, so you you said you've already been selling some stones. You're doing fundraising with stones. Where do you see it going for the future, creatively and business-wise? Yeah. Um, so during high school, especially the next four years, I want to be mainly focusing on faceting, um, selling my gems to help support my business. And then I want to also sell gems to help um, support like start raising money so that I can go to GIA after I finish high school. Um, I want to finish my high school early so that I can start getting enrolled and start taking classes as soon as I can. Being a gem, like being a gemologist has been a dream of mine before I, I even started faceting. Like my grandpa used to point out, do you want to be a gemologist or do you want to be a geologist? Like, okay, so, so that's I, uh... been, it's been something I've wanted to do since I was like eight. Um, and after I learned to be a gemologist, I want to, you know, be able to identify the color gemstones especially and maybe take some courses on pearls and diamonds. Um, and then I want to be able to travel to different rough mines to see like the processes of how the rough is handled and 
Like, I just want to learn how they do that and to get different experiences um, and more knowledge. That's kind of my plan. That's a great plan. Yeah, and I want to go travel, um, travel around the world to be an advocate for fair prices and um, just to learn more about how all of that works. Yeah, no, I think it's great. I, I, I think the idea, for really for any gym cutter, I think the idea of complementing your cutting skills also with the with the gemology knowledge i think it's crucial you know when i speak to cutters especially cutters in europe who you know have a sort of a long tradition of recutting native cut stones you know a lot of the stuff that they tell me and what i've read from you know previous generations attitudes is, is usually the one thing that they differentiate themselves with is you know they're like you know we're gem cutters but we also know gemology, you know, we understand refractive index, we understand critical angle, we understand, you know, different stones have to get, you know, oriented in different ways and everything like that. So they're able to bring out the, be the best of the stone with that gemology knowledge. So I think, I think you have exactly the right plan right now, which is exactly the plan that I did too, which was learning to cut, then going to, to GIA, and then, you know, whatever, seeing what happens after that. I'll, I'll just plant the seed in your mind for whenever it's time, but definitely consider Bangkok when you're ready to do gemology school. That's what I did. And, you know, out here, we're in the center of, of really everything as far as the colored stone trade goes. Like almost every stone in the world, colored stone wise, passes through Bangkok one way or the other. So it's, it, it really feels to me like you're on the kind of the pulse, you know. And, uh, you know, just so many, so many stones to see while you're in school. It's, it's a great atmosphere. So just keep that one in mind. It could be a great uh, additional teaching tool for you. And, and, of course, the mines and stuff that are out here are pretty accessible. So, yeah. Okay. And oh, image, cool. Im Sorry, go ahead. I said, okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. And Imogen, what about you? I know you, you said already that you've been, you know, you and your father are running the shop. You're, you're, you're pretty much going to inherit this retail store that you have in Whitby. Where, where do you see it going? Are, is this going to be a lifelong endeavor or do you have other aspirations in your life as well that have nothing to do with the gemstone trade or are you sucked in completely at this point? <laughs> Well, if you'd have asked me that question when I was 17, I'd have told you I was going to go and study anatomy at university, and I had no interest in being a jet carver. But um, when I started, I, I completely sucked in. I absolutely love it. I can't imagine myself not being a jet carver now. So in the future, I hope to expand on the business that I already have. Um, you know, my dad's in his 70s, so at some point it will all be down to me, um, which is very exciting but also a little bit scary <laughs> um but we have a museum um and it's the last remaining victorian jet workshop so one of the things i'm super passionate about is getting people to understand the history of whitby jet and how pivotal it has been um to the heritage of our town um so i'd like to give that more exposure um i'd also maybe like the opportunity to pass on my skills I personally have felt extremely lucky that I have had um, the ability to come into this job purely because of my dad and granddad, whereas this method of learning is not really open to people unless they have family connections. So at some point, I would like to be able to pass that on to someone else, um, not necessarily related to me, but somebody um, yeah. that is interested because I personally have found that other people that I've talked to have been incredibly helpful um, and they've been really open and they want to pass their knowledge on to me which is amazing because the jewellery trade can be quite sort of a secretive thing um, where things are kept behind closed doors um, whereas that's not the experience that I've found so I wouldn't want that to be the experience that other people have. Um, so that's kind of where I see myself going. Um, okay. So you, So someday I'm going to come visit you and you're going to have an apprentice in there learning Hopefully. all of the ways <laughs> yeah if someone uh, could put up with me <laughs> yeah. and i think i want to just recommend this to anybody who's watching if anybody ever gets a chance if you're if you happen to be in northern england definitely go and check out their shop i i went there i think two two times now this is just is just one view of it and actually if you go if you if you want to there's a whole video that we did on on youtube about this but um the the museum that they have is incredibly 
amazing. And they, they have all this old um, cutting gear from the 1800s and, and you can kind of, you can't really touch it, but you can see it up close and it's just right in the shop next to all their jewelry cases and stuff. So it's so cool. I'm not, you know, this is like my dream as well, like have a shop that's also, you know, the faceting museum. So uh, I, I, I was just so impressed when I, when I went there and definitely uh, for anyone interested, try and see if you can go um, visit. Um, so, okay, I, I've let a bunch of questions build up in the Q and A. So let me just throw these out real quick before they get out of control. Um, okay, so this is going to go to all of you because we're speaking about business right now and we're speaking about how, where the business is going to go. So let's talk about social media because a couple of different people have already asked this question. I wanted to ask the question as well. You know, as you know, uh, as we know, social media is kind of like the thing that the world is revolving around right now. How has it impacted you guys? Because I think probably for all three of you, you were probably already doing social media before you were cutting. I'm just guessing. But for me, it was a different story because, because you know, whatever. But um, how, is this, how has the social media experience affected your ability to make business? Or, or does it have anything to do with your business? Or is it everything to your business? Or Nadine, uh, kick it off. Um, actually, social media was extremely helpful. Um, I wasn't even allowed to touch any social media programs before I started faceting. <laughs> but it was really helpful when it came to learning new techniques um, that I don't even know how I could be where I'm at without all the mentors helping me learn things like Gem Cut Studio, like we talked about earlier, and um, connect connecting in Tucson and things like that. Like, I don't even know how any of that would be possible to get where I'm at without Instagram and Facebook and, and using my Etsy shop and things like that. Okay. Um, and so are you currently now doing most of your sales through social media or, or through Etsy or through some other way? Yeah. Um, most of my sales come through Instagram and some come through Facebook and Etsy too. Um, and then sometimes at the gem shows or in Tucson, I'll sell a few, but it's primarily all online. Okay. Okay. And that, I think that's probably quite interesting for people who are not on social media. I know for me, um, I didn't really realize how powerful Instagram was before. I think it was two or three years ago. I was in Tucson for a month working and I, I saw these people come, kept coming back in our room, buying stuff, leaving, coming back the next day and buying more. And I just asked them like, what are you guys doing? Where are you guys, are you guys flipping this stuff and coming back and buying more? And they're, they're like, no, no, we're, we're just buying it, throwing it up on, on Instagram. Someone's buying it instantly, PayPaling us. We're putting it in the mailbox and then coming back and buying more. And I was just like, oh my God, like at that point I hadn't really, I was on Instagram, but I hadn't thought about it for gemstones at all. I just was using it as a communication tool. And those guys really just kind of flipped my mind about it. And I, and I have learned from other cutters as well and just gem people in general, like it could be maybe one of the most powerful tools that we have right now, especially considering that it's free. Yeah. And I, I like Instagram for two reasons. I like it for those reasons. And I like it because it's a good way to be able to share your story because yeah. where Facebook's like, it like Instagram's very picture oriented. So yeah. it's an easy way, especially with gems to share your work or your story or how you're doing that. Yeah. Yeah. I totally, yeah, I totally agree. Bjorn, what do you think For coming from, uh, coming from Africa? Is it the same situation? Are you deeply entrenched in social media or, or is it not the same? Uh, I think it's uh, slightly different um the the kind of mindset here that people have and what i've seen so far and what i'm trying to do myself is to people are preparing themselves or they're uh, buying rough cutting it so they're waiting for international businesses to come uh, dealers to come here and sell so that's uh, what i'm seeing here and there's a lot of talk in the town about when a dealer's in town um here buying gemstones and so okay, you so. see in an office there's like a line outside an office people are waiting to see this dealer but to buy everything so i think um 
that's the mindset that we have here that um, you sell to the people that come here. And so I'm actually preparing myself to, I'm cutting and stocking so I can uh, do the same thing. Okay. So, so basically yeah. then your business model is really focused on the local market. Like when people come, you're going to have stones to sell. Have you considered or, or thought about putting stuff on Instagram or Etsy or anything like that to, to, to make sales that way? Mm, uh, yes. I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm still learning on uh, how to do business on Instagram and uh, the social media platform so i'm kind of on like a, a educational period right now where i'm learning how people do it because i've seen i'm seeing a lot of terms like business to business and business to consumer like i'm not going to sell to you if you're not business if you're another business so i'm learning all these terms and i'm learning how businesses work on instagram uh, so when i start i can be able to to to, to get my customers i guess yeah, yeah. And so if yeah. you end up making that, that jump into, into social media sales and Instagram sales and whatever, how is the shipping out there? Like, do you, is it easy for you if you needed to ship a stone to me here in Bangkok? Is that something that, can you just go to the UPS the way that I can? Or is it a, more complicated than that? Uh, it's expensive to, to get it shipped to you. Um, but there's UPS and there's DHL. And okay. so, um, yeah, most, like if I was to send a big parcel, I would probably get on a plane and get it to you myself because it it's big parcel and it would probably be really expensive. It would probably be the same amount of, as buying a flight. So okay. uh, why not see Bangkok? Okay. Yeah. So, so this, so for you, this is kind of an interesting hurdle. I mean, this is a hurdle for me here because shipping stuff from Bangkok to the U S is also not as cheap as I wish it was, but maybe, but it's nothing close to a flight. So maybe for you, this is kind of an interesting hurdle that you're going to have to deal with. Like if you, if you want to be as competitive as anybody else on, on Instagram, you know, like you have to, yeah, that's going to be like a special unique um, problem to solve in your particular mm -hmm. locality. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I have a couple ideas of what I would do. I would probably, uh, create enough stock enough uh, inventory and i would probably export a package into the states and have it there and then send it to if i was um working for people working with people in the states i would probably have inventory there and have it sent there um because it would probably be easier within the country than um, yeah. across the sea so and so maybe even for that model, it makes a lot of sense to maybe just save it up for like a Tucson show or a Hong Kong show or something like that, where you can just, you know, have a year's worth of work and just blow it all out in the same month and, and, you know, kind of make your income for the year almost in that way. Yeah. If you can. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, um, I, um, I watched my father go back and forth to, to Tucson with uh, Tanzanite and other rough stones from from tanzania he would have a booth in tucson and he would sell there and that's the only um, business from outside of tanzania he would do um so yeah i think uh uh thank god for um for for um shows like hong kong and tucson hoping yeah. to, to come visit first and see the market and understand because uh, without education, I feel like you you just be going somewhere and you it would be a loss if you don't have the knowledge to, to for the markets, I guess. Yeah, definitely. It's definitely kind of a no, its own world that you have to figure out how to navigate the shows and, and which one's worth it and, and everything like that. So, okay. So Imogen, what about you? You have a, you have an actual shop. So how important it is, is it for you? Are you using social media as well? Are you using Etsy? Are you using any of these kind of platforms to push your work onto? Um, so I have an Instagram. That's where I put most of my work. We also have a website, um, but that's for my, my dad's work. Um, but I'm in the middle of making my own website, which is my work. Um, I have thought about selling on Etsy, but um, I'm not sure about um, using that yet. Um, but Instagram to me is so important because it's like Nadine was saying, it's such a visual medium. So it's like a, a portfolio and everyone can see all of your work. Um, yeah. I have made quite a few sales through it. Um, 
but also it's just a great way to connect with people so to find other people that have the same interests as you to see their work um, and it's just really inspiring to be able to look at everybody else and what they're up to as well and I think um, you know as we look forward to the future being able to connect with people is so important and the fact that we can just you know you can click on someone you can see what they do you can talk to them you can comment I think that's really that's really important um, but definitely the online traffic has been super important you know during the pandemic our shop was shut <laughs> um, yeah. so being able to have things that were directing you towards our website was super helpful um, during, during times like that um, so it, before COVID was most of your sales done directly in the shop by tourists and other people that were coming through Whitby yeah so I have um, most of our work is sold to sort of touristy people that come in. Um, actually, some people come in to our shop because of Instagram. I mean, I do a lot of the silver hairs on the jet, the moon gazing hairs, and someone came in the other day, I was like, you're the moon hair lady, and I was like, yes, that's me. So it does bring people in. It also opens up other opportunities. Um, I mean, I am filming um, a little thing for Channel 5, um, later on next week and the lady who sorted that out found me through my Instagram so I think just having that like, visual portfolio is a great resource um, for other okay. people. So even if it's not actually driving sales it's driving other interesting opportunities or it's driving people yeah. into the store? Yeah absolutely and I think just it's like a big billboard isn't it you know people can see what you do and I think that's great. I don't tend to use Facebook very much for business um, although I think that's another avenue to look down I'm actually quite an introvert, so I find that social media is not something that I'm immediately good at, but um, trying to improve on that, a bit like Bjorn was saying, is, is really important to me. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm much more of a, like, a book person than a digital person, so I'm yeah. trying to learn to be a bit more tech savvy. And so, okay, I, I want to put this to all three of you guys, because somebody asked it in the questions. Um, so we've been speaking about Etsy, we've been speaking about Instagram and Facebook, but have you guys tried other methods? And, and um, someone specifically had asked about Reddit. Has it, have any of you guys used Reddit for sales or even to, just to put your stuff out there on some of the, sub, the different subreddits that are dedicated to either to just gemstone and faceting or there's like specific groups where people are selling their work or, or even making a, almost like their own custom subreddit just for their own like a like a little shop or a, a feed or whatever. Have you guys done this or seen this? I certainly haven't. I mean, I know I've read it, um, but I've never, I've never thought about it as a as a marketing opportunity. Yeah. Um, in fact, the only jewelry subreddits that I've ever found um, generally tend to be empty. So maybe I'm looking in the wrong place. Yeah. Well, uh, the the question uh, the question asker uh put in a couple of examples so i'm going to throw them into the chat just for other people who might also not be using reddit or not know where um the good reddit subs are i'm just going to throw those in there for people to find because there's there's quite a few um and i've been doing that for maybe about a year now maybe more and it's definitely interesting it seems to me like every social media platform has different audience like i'm posting on Facebook, Instagram, Reddit, and LinkedIn. And I find sometimes I get people from LinkedIn, which I never assumed that I would, who, who have no idea that I'm posting stuff on Instagram or Facebook because they're not on them. And I find the same thing with Reddit. It seems like a lot of people who don't really want to mess with all the stuff that we have to wade through on Facebook, sometimes they're in Reddit and they don't really see any of the groups or any of the, the feeds that are on Instagram, but they'll find you that way. So I think that's kind of an interesting way and I yeah it's kind of interesting when people start using social media platforms in new ways I guess one of them well I, I haven't let anyone answer yet about reddit but I also want to throw out tiktok and see if any of you guys know and are using tiktok this way because I know I saw I saw in a webinar last week with um Sibjo they were speaking about it was a social media webinar and they were talking about is tiktok a good platform because it because it's new and it's sort of targeting an even younger generation than than the four of us here um 
is it a good platform for for gems? So tell me if you guys have experiences with that as well. So Reddit or TikTok. Uh, Nadine, did you want to go? Yeah. Um, when it comes to Reddit, I've been ex encouraged to start a Reddit page, but we haven't really had a chance um, to yet. Um, my uncle and a few mentors have been like, hey, you should get this started because you can do this and this and this, where you can't do that on Facebook. It seems like you almost don't have to jump through as many hoops. Um, with TikTok, I mean, I don't know how much of the gem world is on TikTok at all. I mean, yeah. I have friends that have it, but they mostly use it for like personal use and things like that. So yeah. I, that never really spiked me as really a way to get like for people with gem interests, but that could just be me. Yeah, or it could just be because it's also really new and maybe a lot of people don't have it yet. I haven't even looked at it. My wife has it for posting pictures of the dog, but we're not doing it gemstones yet. So, Bjorn, what about you? Have you mentioned <clears throat> Reddit or TikTok or any other social media platforms? Uh, I'm actually on a, like I said before, I'm, I'm learning. Um, uh, I've, I haven't heard of Reddit before. I okay. should really look into that. And uh, concerning TikTok, maybe TikTok could be used as a, as some, a, like a tool to get the message out on faceting. Like it could be used as a, like a, as a, as a transport to, to get to the youth of like younger than us. I'm okay. saying. Like, so you mean how, like, like showing off the actual cutting techniques and stuff like that, like behind the scenes. Exactly, like introducing cutting, like starting from the rough, and then um, I don't know how it works, but you probably take a video of the rough and then post it on the dop, and then post it finished, and then yeah. So having people like understand, okay, so that's really cool. How did that person kind of introducing faceting world to the young, young generation? Yeah. So kind of like to make it more video oriented then because yeah. everything seemed to be videos there. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. No, I think yeah, it's kind of an interesting idea. Maybe, maybe somebody has to start it, you know, like maybe if, if there's no audience for gemstones on there right now, there will be one if you, you know, if all of us start putting our process videos, you know, I'm sure all four of us could have some really interesting little mini documentary style experiences that we can share with people that could also go for Instagram and Facebook and whatever. But, you know, maybe if TikTok is, is, is meant for videos, then maybe it's kind of an interesting way to show off. Um, what about, okay, here's one thing I just thought of one, one thing that I was experimenting with this year. Have you guys heard of and thought about Twitch live streaming for cutting? So this is like a, Twitch is like a platform. Mostly it's used for by gamers. It's, a, it's like a way that you can watch people play video games and kind of talk to them and chat with them. But I actually started to do it with faceting. I set up a bunch of cameras around my machine and I would just, you know, like Saturday morning, I would just go on there for four or five hours and cut a stone that I was already going to cut anyway, but let everybody watch and they can, they can ask questions at the same time. It was pretty cool, but for me, it ended up being a lot of work and the time zone difference for me and everybody else is kind of obnoxious. So I, I didn't keep it up, but have you guys thought about anything like this? I know Imogen, you're, you're kind of cutting all day when you're at, in the shop, having a little webcam on your station could be kind of cool. I'd I've, probably I've, check it out. I have thought about um, videoing more of the processes. I mean, I know that going back to TikTok, I watch a lot of artists and they put like the works in progress on there. So I think, a video medium is actually quite good for gem cutting. Um, my boyfriend watches a lot of Twitch and he watches a lot of like, kind of, I mean, he's a big F1 fan and the F1 drivers were doing online racing. So he was watching a lot of that. Um, but I think that could quite translate quite well for cutting. Um, I don't know how easy it is to respond to the comments though. I don't know how you found that because when I'm, like making jewelry I'm sort of focusing um I am talking to people that come into the shop but I don't know how I would be like sort of like reading the comments yeah. and stuff that's an interesting challenge that would that, that, that was probably the most challenging part for me because basically I have what I did was I set up a like a computer with an extra monitor 
on a shelf above my fasting machine. So it was basically just like right here all the time. But it is, it was kind of, that was the most challenging thing I found was you want, you need to be focused on your work so you don't make a mistake or, or whatever. But mm -hmm. also Twitch, because Twitch already has a sort of an expectation, like the people on there have a sort of expectation. They want to be interacting with you as you go, as if they were there with you. So they want to talk, they want to chat with you and then you can, you know, verbally respond to them. But it, I found it very fatiguing, which is partially why I stopped doing it because, you know, I was thinking in the beginning, I'm just going to stream every single day because I'm cutting all the time. This is going to be great. I'm going to be like the number one Twitch dude. But then what I realized is like one day a week is very, it's, it's like a lot of work, you know, like you really have to focus on keeping everybody active and, and, and you're trying to also, for me, be meditative. And I found it, they didn't work together. It was fun, but not more than once a week. And I was also going very slow that way because I had to keep stopping and, you know, sort of holding the thing up and being like, this is what I'm doing now, you know, and it was cool, but you guys I, should try it out though. Maybe, maybe with your guys's, you know, with your own um, personalities and, and, and whatever, maybe it works well with you guys. It could be interesting. I, I found it was a really cool way to connect with a totally other audience you know more of a especially for bjorn like if you're focused on teaching i don't know how many people you're going to get locally that way but you can start to sort of expand your teaching that way you at least share a little bit because it's really q a oriented like people are asking questions constantly which i thought was fun as a teacher i love that but as a cutter it's sort of obnoxious because i'm trying to focus and you can't do both so um yeah. So yeah, I feel like, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. I was going to say that for me, it would probably be kind of distracting and I would probably be more, because I'm not very good at multitasking usually, so trying to answer questions and try to fast it at the same time or fast it while people are asking questions would be very distracting and um, I wouldn't feel the focus very well on what I'm doing. Yeah. I don't know if that makes sense. No, for sure. It's definitely a good workout for your brain. Maybe it's a good way to learn, you know, sort of a new brain skill, like, okay, I'm going to split right, right now. So, okay, so let's, let's move on. We're, we're getting close to out of time, and I still got two more big questions I want to ask you guys. So let's, let's really get into, we spoke about your guys' specific future paths, but let's just try and f brainstorm a little bit on gem cutting itself as a trade you know, as a skill set, as a hobby, as a competitive form, where do you guys see it going from your point of view, from, from the experience that you guys have had so far, the way that you've been trained and taught and self-taught and the experiences that you've had, whether it be in your shop, online, at, at gem shows, you know, in the gem market, where do you guys see it going? And we'll start with Bjorn. Um, uh, yes, uh, I see it. Uh, it should the future of gem cutting should be with the youth. Um, but I feel like there's a, uh, there's a gap that we need to close down from uh, these cutters that are like have 20 years experience, 30 years experience, 40 years experience into like pouring out the knowledge of what they have into like the youth. Uh, because I'm just thinking if you're, if you have 10 years experience, 15 years experience and you teach me, uh, how to cut and you give me those little perks that you know how um, uh, like the things that you made mistakes a hundred times on and you told me okay if you do this you kind of get rid of that mistake so it was like those little things that could be passed on and from my side I think uh, the future is uh, precision cutting uh, because Everybody wants something different. Everybody wants something that stands out a little bit, something unique. So mm -hmm. I feel like the gem cutting business goes to the direction of pre precision because of the uniqueness in it. And I want to I want to spin that question slightly differently for you. Let's just imagine, like in twenty years, you've succeeded in your goal of training everybody around you in, in precision cutting, and you've you've transformed your whole scene into a precision cutting scene. How do you think that affects, like, let's say for most of our, what I'm guessing is most of our audience is in America, precision cutters in America. 
what do you think that does to the American market if suddenly you can get, let's say, American quality, American style, precision cutting stones, but at the salary rate or whatever, the commission rate of a, of a Tanzanian cutter, how does, it, how does it play out, do you think? Um, I'm sure that the, it will always be different. Uh, it would never be the same. The way I cut is completely different from how you cut or compared to how anybody else cuts. So I think there'll completely be a difference. And I also think that there should be a difference in, in commission and in paying scale, especially because different places in the world have different living costs and different um, uh, pricing on things. So like yeah. the, the, the price that I buy uh, shoes here would be completely different from the price that you buy shoes there in Bangkok or uh, anywhere else in the world. So I think, uh, there's always that difference. There's always going to be that difference. And I think there's, there's an importance in having that difference. Yeah. Okay, good, good, good answer. Um, Nadine, what about you? Um, where, do you? where do you see it going based on what you've seen so far and, and how you've been able to learn as a, as an art, as a trade? Um, that's a good question. I guess I really see mm, a lot more people, especially younger generations, are going to be able to learn due to the social media. Mm -hmm. um, and people, like we've talked about before, like older generations will be able to teach younger generations all sorts of different techniques from wherever you're at because you can connect yeah. through social media and um and like for those those who are self-taught yeah. oh. so as a as a young cutter when you look around at other people in your generation and your age group do you think that you're going to have an inspiring effect on some of the people that you come into contact with or even people that are younger than you? Is that part of your goal or are you just going to kind of see what happens? I would hope to. I would um, like to be able to inspire younger generations to learn and to pursue their goals before they reach to the point where they have to figure it out right then and there, like to start thinking ahead. Um, I mean yeah i would love people to be like i think it's interesting how a lot of people get to like the end of high school and they're like i don't know what i'm gonna do right yeah and i was like think i'm just thinking like wouldn't it be nice if people will start thinking about that before they reached like high school or they actually started thinking seriously about what they actually want to do and start pursuing that yeah no i totally agree this is one of my main questions in life right now is how do we how do we connect with people like what you're saying, either even in high school before they, because when you're in high school, you still have the freedom to play around a little bit and try new stuff before, you know, the, mm -hmm. um, the weight of bills and everything comes on you. So you can, you can still have time to learn a new skill. So this is, I want to come back to this question though, and I'll ask you guys again about that. But Imogen, what do you think? Um, the future of gem cutting from, from your point of view, from your experience, and, and even specifically in Whitby, um, well, one of the big problems that I see in Whitby at the minute is there's a lot of jet that comes into town that's not from Whitby, it's Georgian jet or it's um, Siberian jet. It's not being cut in Whitby, but it's being marketed as Whitby jet. So for me, I would like to see the future of gem cutting in Whitby come back to a more local level. So local people learning the skill and actually cutting it um, themselves. We also have a problem with jet that's being sent elsewhere, um, say Thailand, for example, and it's been carved and the skill and the quality is absolutely fantastic. But because the living costs are so different, the cost of getting that work done is low. So it's then coming back into Whitby and it's being sold for extremely low prices. And then people come into my shop and they're asking me, you know, why does it cost that much? But it costs that much because I have to put the time and the work into making that, um, you know, like Bjorn was saying with the difference in living costs. So I think in Whitby, we really need to inspire um, young 
local people to take it up <laughs> as an art form um, because it's largely sort of ignored um, as a trade in the town. I mean, at one point it employed a third of the population and now there's, you know, less than, I think there's maybe about three people that are under the age of 30 that actually can cut jets. So yeah. hopefully in my area it will become a lot more localised um, or even across the UK, you know, you know, other people. Yeah. And not just from Whitby learning the trade. That would be great. Are you the um, youngest gem cutter in town? The youngest jet cutter in town? I think there is um, another person who cuts jet, the daughter of um, just Sarah, but I, she doesn't do it professionally. She's training to be a lawyer. So um, okay. I think I am the youngest professional gem cutter. Um, of jet in Whitby, yes, definitely. Okay, and so let me segue that into the next and final question I want to ask you guys. So we'll just stick with Imogen since I'm talking to you right now. How, you know, because you said already that you wanted to someday take on an apprentice. So of course you're going to be spreading the knowledge that was shared from your family onto other people. How do you go about doing that? What is the best way, you know, for you as the, the new uh, figurehead of, of jet carving, let's say, how are you going to be able to connect with young people and, and get, not only get them, not only let them know that there is such a thing as gem cutting, which maybe they do or don't, but also get them thinking that they could do it and that it could be a job and that it's worth pursuing. What do you think? Um, I think that's a really interesting question. And I think that's something that I haven't quite worked out yet, but I think social media definitely plays a role in that. Um, you know, people like they often say oh so you, do, you just polish it then which is obviously not what I do I do a lot more work before then so I think you know the videos of showing processes of going from the raw material to the finished material and what it takes is really interesting for people to actually see Um, I talk to a lot of people every single day and um, so talking to them about it um, you know, and if there's anyone who's ever interested in it and they come in and they ask me questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. But I don't know where I would go about finding an apprentice. <laughs> um, that's a really interesting question. Um, maybe maybe we need to look into linking up with um, jewellery schools um, and talking about jet cutting as kind of something that, a skill that can be passed on. Um, because in the UK, if you, you learn a skill for jewellery, it tends to be metalwork. Um, so I think opening the door to lapidry as a whole is something that is quite exciting. Um, yeah. Have you thought about, I don't know if there's such a thing as this, but like whenever high schools have like a, some kind of trade skill day or, or I don't know, do they have something where people were, you know, maybe for seniors in high school, they have a chance to like meet local businesses and see what it's like to go out and, or, or, you know, whatever, meet potential future employers. Is there anything like that that you could connect into to try and show people what you do? Um, that is interesting. I haven't really thought about that. So I went to school in Scotland, not England. So my knowledge of the English school system is a little bit patchy. Um, we do do a lot of school parties though, so they tend to be kids that are probably between 8 to 10 um, and they come in and I do a talk about Whitby Jet and I talk about the um, touring workshop um, and it's, we've been doing those talks for years, I mean I had like a, a person older than me come in and say oh I, I came to a school party here when I was 10 and your dad was telling me about it, so maybe that's sort of a way to to encourage people, especially when you've got a captive audience and they're 10, and I think yeah. 10 is quite an impressionable age. Maybe I can sort of sneak attack them with like gem cutting as a possibility for their future careers. Yeah. Well, I know somebody in the audience um, was saying, who, you know, they're a school counselor and, and maybe, maybe people at that age, you know, high school or younger, maybe they're not ready to, to, um, kind of connect with this thing that's going to be the rest of their life right but I, I kind of think about whenever I mean looking back at my own history and I'm thinking if I would have known about gem cutting when I was in high school I wonder like would that have would that have changed my life would I have not been ready for it yet I mean who knows obviously it's personal for everybody but who, who knows as well maybe if you have one of these parties or one of these talks and you put it out there that like you're looking for potential apprentices maybe that's going to click a light bulb in somebody's mind and they're going to suddenly imagine themselves in your shoes or in your bench uh, doing what you do. So 
Yeah, it's something to think that's about. A really, that's a really interesting idea, definitely. Okay. Well, I'll just, I'll just leave that with you then. Nadine, what do you think? Um, how do we connect with, how do we try to connect with the next generation? What's the best way from your point of view as the next generation? How do you see it? Um, I mean, if you're speaking local, I think doing things like local gym shows and things like that is a good way to get the community together. Um, and they do things like demonstrations, like I showed in one of the pictures before and things like that. But if we're not think talking local and we're talking more like global and worldwide, then I think social media or traveling is probably the best way to connect like sharing your story or um just planting the seed like what you do just so that people know that it's something that exists because i don't know how many people like i've talked to and they're like that's a thing like yeah like what's fasting that's actually something that people do like you cut the gems that that requires work and it's like yeah you have to like it, they don't just poof out of nowhere. You don't just find them in the ground like that always. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. I like, I like where you're going with this. What do you think about, I, I mean, what you said, connecting with people at trade shows, obviously this is a great idea, but we're only going to connect with people who already were going to come to a trade show. So what if we want to branch out, you know, like what if you wanted to try to introduce all of your high school classmates to the idea that there is such a thing? I'm homeschooled. So that I got it experience with okay. when it comes to public schooling that's how I actually have the time to to focus on this yeah. um but another thing that we've actually done before is um the fairs like we have um agriculture fairs here and things like that um where you can do displays and um sometimes they do demonstrations not usually yeah. But usually, like, our local rock club does a display there, and they let, like, we'll stand there, and people can talk to us, and we, re we like, tell a lot of different people about, um, like, fastening and things like that, just okay. because, just through the, like, booths. Like, people come up, they're curious. They want to yeah. know what this is. They don't know. Yeah, no, it, I think that, that's great. People want to learn. Yeah, no, that's a great idea. Yeah, I mean, the local fairs, state fairs, county fairs, whatever you have, that's such a good idea because it's, to me, I think maybe the most important thing or a important thing is not only focus on the people who are already in the community, whether they're cutters or not, because obviously we've already sort of hooked those people. But I just imagine myself as a 13-year-old, I didn't know that there was a gem trade. I actually didn't even know that until I was almost 30. Like I didn't know there was this whole other world of gemstone people and, and just weirdos who love rocks as much as we all do, you know? And like, I don't know what would have happened if I knew that as a teenager. Maybe I couldn't have changed my path, but maybe I would have jumped into this way earlier. Uh, you know, who knows? I'm happy with how it turned out. But like, I'm just imagining for the next generation of people, especially because I know that there's so many less opportunities for, at least in America, there's so many less opportunities for hand skill based jobs, you know, like everything now is offices, serving, you know, do, just doing sort of mental things or whatever, not craftsman type things. So I'm just trying to imagine how can we, how can we connect to all those like ADHD kids who are super fidgety and can't stop messing around with stuff and, and don't have any um you know like a uh, way that they're going to connect with the world without like using their hands you know and and i think fasting is such a good thing for people like that for people like us probably um so okay so i i just again i'm just planting some seeds here um bjorn what do you think you're you're already involved with teaching you're already connected with you know what's going to be the next generation in your community but where how do you how do you pull even more people into that world that you're in or that school um i think uh like um nadine was talking about uh, local fairs we have here a, a 77 um fair or 88 fair which is on the 7th of the 7th uh 7th of the 7th and the 8th of the 8th of the year of the month and so um we have just these fairs of 
they're mostly like agriculture and things like that. But um, yeah, so, uh, but also Gem Legacy is doing a couple of scholarships here. I saw Dan come in here, but yeah, that reminded me. Um, Gem Legacy is doing a couple of scholarships uh, for students here. And um, I think that's a good way to, to, to help these kids understand um, how, like how cutting is a good thing. And um, I was also thinking about mentorship programs and going and speaking in schools, uh, the secondary schools, government secondary schools here about uh, gemstones and probably doing like a day, um, uh, like a day camp or something like that, just so people could get exposed to gem cutting here. And, uh, but I think uh, knowledge through, uh, tools like Gem Legacy and other NGOs to like come here and teach and spend time and give knowledge to, to, to people here. I think that's the, the, the great way to go. Cool. No, I love it. I think you guys are doing great work. I mean, when I saw, I think it was already a year ago now when I first started seeing the post from, from Gem Legacy and, and what, you know, what Roger was posting and I was, I, I, as soon as I saw it, I was like, okay, I got to donate to that because this is exactly what I believe in. You know, this is exactly something that I want to contribute to just like helping anybody who's trying to help gem cutters. This is, a, you know, directly coming from my own heart as well. So I think it's awesome what, you know, that whole, that whole movement is, is doing out yes. there. And it's cool to see, to talk to you here and see, okay, you're one of, you know, you're almost like part of that process in terms of like you, you you know you now have upgraded your skill set pretty much directly because they've been donating machines and stuff like that right like otherwise you wouldn't be doing yeah. i'm just guessing but you wouldn't be doing precision cutting right now if it wasn't for you know the gym legacy stuff yeah definitely i feel uh actually uh, i want people to understand what arusha tanzania is like arusha tanzania is uh, the way I see it is like a gem hub for Africa, like stones from Kenya would come here, stones from Congo would come here, stones from Mozambique would come here. You would see all types of stone here. So if you um, teach the youth here about um, cutting and gem cutting, it's, it's, it's like the correct place to do this. And I think uh, Gem Legacy is speaking in 2 p.m. Eastern time and they're talking about uh, the school and how to go for it. And yes, they've been a really big help, actually. They've uh, given new machines, new Facetron machines, just to, to change the level of teaching. And, and it's easier to teach someone how to, to cut on, on a Facetron and to understand like the designs and stuff. So they've taught me a lot and they've helped me a lot to, to get where I am now. So yeah. it's, it's very important. Yeah. yeah, so cool. I know for us here in Bangkok, you know, we we've been running this cutting school here for a couple of years and, and I, I've been thinking a lot about, you know, how to take it to the next level because, you know, we're only able to do so much. Like we have like the sort of boot camp style class that we do. It's two weeks, but then, you know, there's some students like, like let's say the all-star students that have come through there and I'm and they're staying connected with me through, through WhatsApp or social media or whatever. And I'm, I've been watching them for now more than a year seeing, okay, a year ago they graduated. Now they're making jewelry with their own stones or now they're doing whatever they're doing. And I'm kind of thinking like, what's the next step? You know, kind of what Imogen was saying, like, we need to, we need to make an apprenticeship program. Like you can only do so much in a, in a school, right? It's too, for us, it's too expensive mm -hmm. to have someone come in for a year. You can't do that in a school. It's, it's not practical for us here yeah. but to yeah. have someone come into our studio like one-on-one -on -one time for a year this is an interesting idea and i can imagine i can imagine you doing this i can imagine imogen doing this in her in her shop as well because she has well she could have the space to do it or whatever um and this is how it's always been transmitted right through apprenticeships through one-on-one -on -one, yeah. you know direct interaction with a master cutter and um this is something that's really fall, fallen away. And I know I, I've been kind of seeing this popping up in the comments, you know, bring back trade schools. And I, I totally think it's right, you know, like, and, and someplace like Africa, it makes a lot of sense because cost of living is lower. You can make a program like that that's even long-term. I know that there's one in, in Madagascar. I don't know if it's good, but I know that it exists and you can go there for like a few months and, um, <laughs> you'll get trained or whatever. So the idea that someone could come in for you guys for 
even a year or whatever, you know, I know in England, the yeah. traditional apprenticeship is like five years or used to be. So mm -hmm. wow. it would be great if someone yeah. could come in for five years. No, I don't think any, co any country has that, um, that sort of uh, architecture set up, you know, socially anymore to do a yeah. five-year apprenticeship. Yeah. Even England yeah. can't hardly do that anymore because of so many reasons. But um, I think this is a project for our, you know, our young minds. Like we have to figure out because we've been lucky enough to get trained one way or the other, we got to figure out how to make it a little bit bigger because like, you know, we see what Nadine's doing at, at 14 years old, like, okay, you can go so far with just one person showing you or having a few different mentors. But imagine if someone took you in their studio for a year, someone who's professionally yeah, working, yeah. you, you go so fast, yeah. you know, like you go so fast. So yeah. Yeah. this is, this is like a challenge I'm putting out to the, all four of us and anyone who's watching this. Like if you have the ability to spread the knowledge further and you can take someone in your studio or you have a shop or whatever it is, or you can do a scholarship to go to some other school, whatever it is, this is, you know, this yeah. is how we, this is how we put it forward. I, I think we could continue yeah. to talk about I, this for another hour, but I think we're, we got to get it definitely. off. Um, let me, yeah, let I was, me, I was, yeah, go, final thought. What do you got? I, I, yeah, I was just going to say what you're saying is really true because I, I would check on my calendar and like the days where, um, Roger Derry would come, I would put them like marked definitely because that time spending with him in the office trying to learn from him would be like my favorite moments of the month i'd be like yes he's coming so i got get my notebook out and make sure that he's teaching me so uh, i think mentoring programs are really um really 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 important yeah yeah and i know from some of the i'm just kind of keeping an eye on the chat as we go and um you know maybe maybe there's some doubt that the future generation has the patience and the uh the willingness to sit down and do the work. And, and I, I wouldn't argue with that because many gem cutters have told me that they, 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 they stopped their apprentice, you know, they stopped working with their apprentices because their apprentices weren't being serious. But I think that the three of you already break that mold because you guys are here and you guys have done it and you guys are doing it. So, you know, maybe, maybe my generation, your generation and everyone's new generations are not the same as the old generation, but there are some people that we can pick out that will, do that you know just as we the four of us did there's going to be more of us That's true. and the more opportunities we we give them to find us and for us to find them i think we'll find you know we, we, we will do a better job at, at pulling those people out of whatever path they were on and and showing them that there is an alternative path you know this alternative route which is gem cutting um, let me put up, okay, I'm going to give you guys all uh, a, a moment to just have a final word, but let me put up this last screen. So um, just so if people want to follow, find us and follow us and see what we're doing, this is everybody's contacts and social media. And I, I want to just say thank you to all of you guys and to all of our guests and to the U.S. Fasteners Guild for putting this whole thing on. Um, but I want to just have a moment with each of you to, to just get a final idea because we've just said so much in the last, uh, you know, almost uh, hour and a half or whatever. So Imogen, what do you think? Final thought. Um, where, we, where do we go from here? What, what, what do we do? What do you think? Um, yeah, I think, like you're right about saying that one of the main things we should do is sort of try and inspire other people and pass on our knowledge. And I would hate to think that I got the opportunity to learn something and then not give that back to someone else. So I think whether that's through an apprenticeship program or whether that's through putting content online, I think, it, like you say, it's almost a responsibility that we have to pass on our skill. Um, yeah. But I think we all would agree that we've still got other skills we want to acquire as well. So yeah, as we go through, just keep going forward and sharing it as we go. Okay, well said. Nadine, what do you think? Final thought. Um, Where do we go from here? Just keep working at our dreams and and yeah. 
Okay. I think that's simply enough put. The dream is really what it's all about. And uh, the further we can push it, the further we can inspire people, you know, they're going to, they're going to reciprocate that energy that we can put out there too. So um, Bjorn, what do you think? Final thought, anything else we, we have to say tonight? Uh, yeah. Um, I, when I, when I'm at the school, I see how people are really interested in learning and they're like asking me questions and asking me again to make sure that they made, they, they understand. And um, it just gives me a little, um, thought that uh, we should really try and educate people as much as possible and where places that are needed like here in Africa we we need all the education we need and uh, I'm sure John Legacy are going to talk about that uh, later on but um, I would also like to learn from other people cutting I would like to see what people do differently so I think uh, if we have like a, um, uh, I'm trying to get I want to get through and get have like unity with people cutting who are way more experienced than me so I can learn things from them. And so we can all share the, the knowledge. Yeah. yeah, me too. Me too. I love, I love meeting yeah. older cutters who know things that nobody else knows. It's, 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 a, it's wild out there. Okay. So um, I, yeah, once again, I really want to thank all three of you. This has been an, just an awesome conversation. You know, I've always kind of wanted to, get a bunch of young people together and see what's going on. And, and it was really, really, really satisfying for me. I hope everybody else that's uh, watching this has, has been, you know, as entertained and informed as me. I know I didn't get to every single question that was asked because we just don't have enough time, but um, feel free to connect with anybody through whatever social media channels you use. I'm sure everyone's open to getting an email or getting some questions or whatever personally. And um, before we end it, I want to just throw up the schedule for the rest of the, um, for the seminar, for the, all the seminars. And I'm going to post the links just to make it easy for you guys. Uh, this is what's going on for the next few days. And I'm going to post all of the links into the chat with, with, cause every, um, every seminar has its own zoom room. So you guys can save these and uh, they're all in the chat right now. So all the links to each one of these, so you can, copy and paste them into your notes or whatever. Um, again, I want to thank U.S. Fasteners Guild for inviting me to come and uh, organize this, this mini conversation. And I want to, again, thank all three of you for, um, for joining me and, and just giving me such good, insightful um, comments and answers and, and just giving us a look into your world. It's been great. It, for me, it's very inspiring to see the young generation. I, w I invite all of you guys, at whenever it's the moment for you, come out to Bangkok, even just to come hang out. And I, I would love to show you guys around the, the, the gemstone market here. And, and I definitely want to come and visit all of you guys where you're at, whether it's Tucson or Arusha or Whitby or whatever. Um, you know, okay. let's, let's keep this conversation going uh, as well as with other young cutters, you know, because there's many. Um, so yeah, thank you guys. Yeah. It's great. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to share. Yeah. I hope it was, it was not too nerve wracking. Yeah. Um, okay, well, thanks to everybody. And I'm going to close this down. Um, I know we get, went over time, but there's still, we're, we're still, um, we're still a few minutes away from Roger and Rachel's, Rachel's talk. I think, oh no, it's in an hour still. So we have one hour until the next talk. So, um, Thank you guys, and uh, I will catch you guys somewhere in the future. Signing yeah. off from Bangkok. Bye. Bye. <laughs>